Jake Swanko. I am a director of photography and a producer. It was one of those stories, so we had, um, with Icarus, we were right in the middle of all this, this story that was happening, and, and we were sort of releasing the information, whereas with this film, with The Dissident, we sort of approached it, uh, we came to the story after it happened, so it was an immediate past, right? And we this this was already an international scandal that was unfolding. And so we approached it by understanding that there were several factors that we had to solidify in order to tell the story properly. One of those was the fiance of Jamal Khashoggi, Hatija Jengez, and the other was Omar Abdulaziz, who was a prominent dissident in Montreal, and the third was the Turkish government. So in order to make the story, we isolated those things as this those were what we needed to tell the story the way we wanted to tell it and to be on the inside of this of the circle of information and so we started to work in and solidify that access little by little and leading to uh, a year-long project which was a very complex political sort of geopolitical um, crime thriller well i think we have a, a group of people that, uh, three or four um, core creative people that we come to, and it's uh, Brian Fogel, Mark Monroe, myself, and our composer, Adam Peters. And we kind of come together and say, you know, is this a story that has those benchmarks for telling the type of story we want to? And we kind of decide whether we want to jump and take it, you know, and this is just our second film together. So this had all the themes that we were looking for in terms of, you know, a thriller, um, a geopolitical cover-up, um, huge power involved, um, murder, um, and love, too. So we saw this as one of those timeless stories of freedom of expression, freedom of speech, and we went for it. But we kind of deduced that it was one of those stories that had to be told. Well, it's like it's a it's it's a scary. You want to you hope you can tell a scary story. You know, you hope you can put yourself in a situation where it's like, wow, uh, this could put everything at risk, could put me at risk, and and uh, otherwise, you know, I. We just kind of go for the big stories, you know, and I think the next one, I don't know how it's going to get bigger than the last one did, but then again, we said that same thing with Icarus. We was like, what are, what are we going to do after Icarus? And then this one came along, and now we're going to be like, never cease to look at the, the headlines. There's always some new crazy stuff that's happening. I think... Um, I'm lucky enough to work with people that agree with the fact that we can't create like just a straightforward documentary and that if we have the production value, especially with this film, you're talking about a journalist who's by all means one of us and or just a fellow human being and was searching for um, the right to marry his fiance and he entered a consulate believing that he was safe and he was murdered. And that story in itself brings to you this sort of sense of urgency, this fight in you to make sure that you get the best production quality, that, that you fight for your creative decisions, that you make a film that ultimately you're extremely proud to stand behind. Because um, for me in this story and how important it was or is, um, I couldn't live with myself knowing that I didn't do everything that I did could within my means to make sure that its production value matched that of a narrative film. And I think we accomplished it to a certain degree. Um, but, you know, um, on projects, there's a group of people, but ultimately you come down to some of the decisions you want to make as a, as a filmmaker, as a, as a person. And... Ultimately, there's teams, but it relies on individuals to take the onus to say that this absolutely has to be the best I can possibly do. And um, so 
that's worth fighting for. You know, that's that's worth risking your safety. That's risk worth risking alienation from creative decisions. And it's just it's just it's part of. Um, I feel like the gap between fiction and nonfiction is becoming closer and closer because people really love when they can watch a film and be like. God, that's not fake. That's that's real. That's a real story that really happened in the world I live in today. I should really pay attention to more some of the things that are happening, and I should really seek out more stories like this because I think people want to feel real. You know, they want to see movies that are real. They want to like because some. I mean, some of the stories in our everyday lives are far stranger than any scriptwriter could come up with. I mean, the story about Jamal Khashoggi was so bizarre that the Turkish media had to break it twice to news outlets because they believed it was too outlandish to be true. And it wrapped in all of that is, 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 is this time, these timeless stories that um, are most importantly personified as truth to power, you know, speaking truth to power. And that was um, ultimately what drove our production value, which drove the amount of time we spent on a story, all hands on deck, and um, every decision pushed towards truth to power. Well, you try and you try and search for a scene that um, you, you try and search for a room that speaks to your story a bit. Um, with interviews, it's you know if I stuck you in a white walled room and it was three feet wide by like 10 feet long, the interview's gonna look like shit. You know, it's just, that's what it is, you know? So I'm only as good as the room I put myself in, right? So if I have a 15 person crew, I, so that's always was the argument, is you basically start off being like, okay, we're gonna spend X amount of dollars on this with a uh, eight person crew, cameras, lights, give me a good location and I'll make it look great. It's a pretty easy argument if you think about it. So, but, like where we came from with Icarus was much more bare bones and we were shooting interviews and, and doing them in hotel rooms. And for this one, we, we had just, you know, I just, part of it, the, the deal was to location scout to find the best places. And once you can find a location that's big enough and it has accents and things like that, it, it kind of really plays better in terms of the overall aesthetic and just understanding who you're interviewing and what, what they're gonna be saying and what sort of space should they be in an office sort of setting? Should they be in a newsroom? Should they be um, just in kind of an old rustic looking location? Or, you know, Turkey has so many beautiful uh, banquet halls and things like that. So you can, you know, just finding the space where, you know, it's comfortable for people to talk into. And ultimately all those things aside, the only thing that really matters is those two people having a conversation because if the one, the other one doesn't feel comfortable, all that is for nothing. You know, if you set up all these lights and everything, you spent a week waiting for the interview, for thousands and thousands of dollars, and if people don't feel like talking to their interview, then that's just what happens. And sometimes that does happen, but it's your, your job to make sure that the production value doesn't get in the way of just two people talking, just like you and I are right now. There's no, there's no catch-all. It's just time. It's just relating to people, and you know, you know, people are disclosing very personal things about their lives, and it's important to not be um, callous when hearing those things, and to to relate to them and to speak about your own personal life to a certain extent. Some journalists will say, no way would I ever do anything like that, you know? But I think the important value is, is, is spending time with people and you show up days where you don't film or interview or ask questions. You just go out to like coffee and drinks and dinners. And it's actually quite easy on me too because then I don't have any responsibilities other than just getting to know people and that's the way it should be. You have to get to know people and and so there's no trick to doing it. It's just you spend time with people and the same way if I was to interview you, I would, you know, we would spend time together, talk and, um, you know, I'd eventually decode what questions to ask you and that comes with time and not always do you have the luxury of time but 
luckily with the the films that I've worked on, um, I'm given that because they see that as value. <laughs>